well, the algorithm probably hates my break that I took last week, but hopefully you don't, because I'm back with more sociology. Last week, we looked at socialization, and really went into a couple of theories about that, and this week, we'll be building on top of that with societal structures. I'll be covering the divisions of society, social relations, and social institutions, and finally going into a bit of normal and the creation of normal. So let's get right into it then, shall we? First up, we have the divisions or construction of society. As you'd expect, society needs more than one person to be a society, and there are many different groupings and types of relations, and a whole lot more that will be covered in this episode. Overall, though, there is a tension between those social structures, their effects, and our own individual agency. One division that has a large effect on our social existence is our roles, such as ascribed roles, like location of birth, assigned gender, familiar relations, or earned roles, like occupational titles, educational achievement, or parental status. These roles come with lots of expectations that we're implicitly pushed to fulfill. If we take gender, for example, because that's my favorite, men are pushed by society to dress a certain way, hide their emotions that aren't anger, and punch shit when they're mad. This isn't to say there's no agency, we can influence the role's box to shift through repeating different patterns of social interaction than those expected of the role. For example, by troubling gender by not fitting the exact role. Thanks, Butler. Roles, though, are just one division of society, so let's get on to the next one. Social groups. These can be defined broadly in terms of primary or secondary, or intimate or impersonal. The former primary and intimate groups are groups such as a school class or a friend group, and the latter are groups like fandoms or political movements. Primary groups can be considered to be the foundational unit of society, as they are often long-lasting due to their smaller, often face-to-face -face nature. Conversely, secondary groups are often impersonal, ephemeral, and large. What both kinds have in common, though, is that they're often the result of shared identities, interests, or goals. Another commonality is their ability to act as reference groups for our own social behavior, regardless of your membership to them. Social groups are also a source of us versus them mentality, or in-group versus out-group. Groups have shared norms that members are expected to follow, including things like jargon, slang, etc., that can create an in-group solidarity and an in-group identity, often to the exclusion of others within the out-group. Building on this, then, there's social networks. As everyone that covers this topic brings up, yes, social media is a good, bad, whatever example of social network. Very visual, it can show the connections between people and groups and demonstrate social interactions between people. Given that they don't necessarily have to be direct, knowing a guy who knows a dude whose aunt's cousin's friend works at Google can get you places that simply associating with your close group mates like parents or friends can't. Overall, it's the connections between people in a big ass web. Next key social division, then, is social institutions. This can be various institutions in society like religions, healthcare, governments, cults. Broadly, they fall into three main categories, utilitarian, normative, and coercive institutions. Utilitarian concerns itself with how useful it can be. Think healthcare, banks, employers. Basically, any institution that benefits people in some way. Normative institutions, then, are those that seek to voluntarily impose norms, morals, and values upon people, or pursue those morals and values that they are centered around. Examples of these include religions and non-governmental charity organizations. The last one is hopefully quite self-explanatory then, where coercive institutions seek to impose things by force. So prisons, cults, and cryptocurrency groups. Wait, I said cults twice, didn't I? Oh well, you get the picture though. As a whole, social institutions are enduring social groupings that address a need in society, be it keeping people healthy, keeping society functioning, or scamming people out of their money. And then the last thing I want to cover today is the social construction of normal. Earlier I mentioned how social groups can create an exclusionary environment through prioritization of the in-group and creating in-group solidarity to the exclusion of an out-group. This can lead to a process of creating a normal and having people be othered. Essentially, it portrays people who aren't in that particular in-group as the other, and creates an idea of what's normal and what's deviant. When it happens on a society-wide level, you can have awful things like racism, sexism, queerphobia, ableism, etc., and you can create a normal idea of 
the default person being a cishet white able-bodied dude, and everyone else is defined in opposition to them. You don't mention that, oh, my white coworker did such and such, but you would mention, oh, my black coworker did. This is an example of that oppositional definition. Early modern feminism in the space of gender was especially concerned with this, where Simone de Beauvoir considered woman as being the other to the default man. If you can stomach dense philosophy, the second sex is a uh, fun read <laughs> and tackle this idea in depth. But this doesn't mean, though, that the idea of normal is set in stone. Within Western society, there has been a movement to depathologize and de radicalize the identity of queerness, especially successful in creating a normal where white binary trans people can exist within normal. Because after all, a short guy or a tall woman are still a guy or a woman, respectively. What this goes to show, though, is the malleability of the idea of normal and how it can vary across time and space, much like society as a whole. Today, we covered the divisions and structures of society, building from groups of two or more people into networks and into institutions, finally ending up with a discussion of normal and its creation through society and social interaction. Next week, we'll be taking a look at how my, and well, probably a lot of my view of society, is organized around stratification, capital, and intersections of identities. As always, link to that follow-up video, episode 4, is over here to my right, or you can just rewatch the previous episodes if you're watching this one early. Questions are very welcome, and I'll try my best to answer them, but until next week, that's all.